As we, we look at the resurrection this morning, we're going to be reading from John chapter 20. Now, while you turn there, as I think of this, the resurrection account, the resurrection story, it reminds me of a suspense thriller. Now, suspense thrillers, that's the genre of movies, myself and Corinne, we love it. You watch it, and you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen next. You, you're watching the plot progress, and you're thinking, who's it going to be? What's going to happen? And you get to the end of the movie, and it happens, and your mind is blown. Um, probably my favorite suspense movie of all time is Shutter Island by Leonardo DiCaprio, he's the, the main guy in there, and you get to the end of the movie, and you're watching the credits like, what? just happened now. And why I like these kind of movies is because, not only because it's exciting and it keeps you at the end of the, your seat, but when you get to the end of the movie, then you finally realize what the whole plot has been about. Um, why the, 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 the characters said what they said, why they did what they did, and forgive me, why they killed whom they killed. Now you know at the end, and you get to the realization um, of what actually happened. So if this is how we characterize a suspense thriller movie, I think we have to admit that the story of Jesus is much like a suspense thriller, isn't it? Because along the way, Jesus had been leaving snippets, Jesus had been leaving clues, and even those who walked so closely with him, they were like watching this movie unfold in front of their eyes, and they still didn't fully realize everything that was happening even though Jesus had been telling them the story all along. Not only was Jesus telling them the story, but he was actually telling them how it was going to end. And even when those events happened, they still didn't fully comprehend um, what Jesus had been saying. But as we look at the resurrection account in John this morning, we're going to see three people or three groups of people who come to certain realizations as the resurrection takes place. And as we look at the things that they realize, these are realizations that we have to arrive at as well as Jesus' followers. So let's have a look at John chapter 20, and we're going to pick it up right at the beginning from verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. And they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked the woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? And thinking he was the God, and she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive uh, them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with him. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen, you, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Father, all we can ask is that you would open up our minds so that we can understand what your word says. Open up our hearts that we may receive as well. Speak to us, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we work through this chapter, we're not going to do it verse by verse. We don't have the time for that. But I'm going to focus on these three encounters that Jesus had with these people. First with Mary, then with a group of the disciples, and then finally his encounter with Thomas after the resurrection. Now, it's obvious from us having read this chapter that these people still did not realize what was happening. And I find it so difficult to comprehend, but I, I, if I were to put myself in their shoes, perhaps I would be guilty of, of the same thing. So as we see it, Mary is the first to discover, Mary Magdalene is the first to discover the resurrected Lord. She goes to the tomb, she sees it empty, and immediately her first reaction is to assume someone came and stole the body of Jesus. She runs, she tells the disciples, John, who it is believed is the disciple who Jesus loved, and Peter, they run, and they see, and they, they discover, yes, the tomb is empty, the, the, the body is gone, where is Jesus? And they leave the scene, but Mary still lingers there, and I want to focus on Mary and Jesus first. She comes into the tomb, but she sees what Peter and John did not see. She sees these angels, one at the head, one at the foot. And they ask her this question, Mary, why are you crying? She then responds with a logical answer. She responds then with the reason for which she is crying. Someone took the body. I'm concerned about this. That's why I'm crying. She turns around. She sees Jesus, and I think it's so fitting that he asks her the exact same question. Woman, why are you crying? And she still doesn't realize who she's speaking to. Until Jesus says, Mary, she finally recognizes him and she says, teacher, it is you. She was astonished. She was amazed. Perhaps she was even surprised to see Jesus. 
But I want to focus on that question that I asked her. Why are you crying? This question is one of the weapons in my arsenal that I use with my children. Why are you crying? I ask them many, many times. And when I ask my child the question, why are you crying? I don't actually want to know the reason for which they are crying. Because I just solved the reason for which they were crying. And I'm standing here wondering, child, why are you crying? Right? And I think that it is the same reason that this question is asked of Mary. The question isn't really, why are you crying? The question is, Mary, why are you still crying? Because Jesus is standing here. And in fact, what they are actually trying to tell her is, Mary, you don't need to cry anymore. Because the reason for which you are crying does not exist any longer. You were crying because of this dead Jesus, but he stands now next to you, alive, in person. Did you not know that? There was no reason for her to cry anymore. Now, I'm probably going to be a bit harsh on Mary here. But didn't she remember the words of Jesus along with the other disciples when he told his followers that he would rise to life again on the third day? Didn't she remember that? And again, even as we read in this passage, Jesus says this is what happens in accordance with the Scripture. So first of all, Mary had the very words of Jesus that came out of his mouth, and then they also had the recorded words in the Old Testament that the Messiah would die and that he would rise again on the third day. Mary, did you not know? And why are you still crying? Because Jesus is standing here. You see, and this is important. Because I believe Mary knew the truth of what they told her. But she didn't yet realize the importance of the truth. She didn't yet realize what that truth meant. Now, now, now if we are harsh on Mary, I want to say, brothers and sisters, we should put ourselves in Mary's shoes. Because this is where we are guilty Lots of the times when it comes to our faith. Did you not know? Don't you remember what God's word said? Yet you still cry. Yet you still fear. Yet you are still worried. Yet you suffer from anxiety so frequently. Don't you remember what the word of God said? And like Mary, we cry. Like Mary, we are grieved. Because we don't fully realize the promises of God and what it means for our lives. You see, they were not asking Mary, why are you crying? The question is, Mary, where is your faith? Because if Jesus had prepared you with words, and if the scripture pointed out clearly that this would happen, is it now not expected that you would place your faith in what you heard? And believe that the things you heard would actually come to pass. You see, there was no reason for them to cry. Because if they believed Jesus, she wouldn't be there on that morning going to prepare the body. She would be there waiting in anticipation for the tomb to be empty. If her faith was where it should have been. And this is us, brothers and sisters. This is who we are many times. Because we forget what the Word of God says. We forget He said He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We forget that He's a friend that's closer than a brother. We forget the many promises that God made us. And so our reaction is not reactions of faith, but of fear and of worry and of concern. And so I want to ask you this morning, why are you crying? Maybe a better question is, why are you still crying? Jesus is standing right there next to you. As Mary recognizes his voice, he instructs her to go and tell the disciples what she had seen. And you know, when Jesus, oh, it just seems 
There's just something different about the Jesus before resurrection and the Jesus after resurrection. We know the Gospels are full of everything that Jesus said and everything that he'd done up until the point where he died. But now if you read the Gospels post-resurrection, it's like his words, the, the, the little words that he says just has so much more meaning. And maybe he's even intentional because he tells her, go and tell them what you've seen and that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He could have simply said, go and tell them I am ascending. But he's affirming for them that through what he has accomplished, he's our father as well. He's our God as well, as much as he is the, the Father and the God of Jesus. But let's move on to this second group of people now that Jesus reveals himself to. On that same day, Jesus finds the disciples locked behind closed doors in fear of the Jewish leaders. Now the doors were locked, yet he still appeared. Now, immediately our minds start racing because, look, there's this supernatural thing happening with the body of Jesus. All of a sudden, he appears, but at the same time, he shows them his hands, his feet, and his side. So, so there seems to be something different about the body of Jesus. Now, I don't want us to get caught up on trying to figure this out because I don't think the Bible mentions that for this reason. But the reason we, it is mentioned that Jesus reveals himself in this way is to confirm to the disciples that he is real. That he in fact died and now is risen to life as Mary testified and as John and as Peter testified as well. It served to authenticate what he had done. That's the main significance. But here I find something very interesting. He comes through. He shows himself, he says, peace be with you, and then he makes this statement, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Now, I think Jesus could have taken the opportunity to do so many things. My brothers, don't worry, I'm alive. Stop your crying and rejoice. Let's have a worship session. Let's enjoy this moment because we defeated those people, but he does not. He takes the opportunity to reveal to them now what is expected of them. If you look at the end, now each of the Gospels has an account of the resurrection. And in each of them, as soon as the resurrection takes place, we see Jesus commissioning his disciples for the work. The resurrection happens in Matthew 27. Matthew 28 says what? Go now and make disciples of all nations. You look at the book of Mark, the resurrection takes place, and Jesus' words to them after the resurrection go into all the world and preach the gospel. The same thing happens in the book of Luke, which is very similar to Acts. You have the resurrection account, and Jesus says the, the re repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be preached in my name, and he tells them, you will be witnesses of this. Now, John is more detailed about what happens post-resurrection because there's a conversation between Jesus and Peter as he reinstates Peter. However, we find the same commissioning of his disciples immediately after the resurrection takes place. The realization the disciples had is the realization, brothers and sisters, that we must have as well today. And that, first of all, there is a close connection between the resurrection and Jesus commissioning his disciples. What did you come to church to celebrate today? That Jesus is alive? Good, because he is. But the question we must ask is, now that Jesus is alive, what? Because Jesus didn't simply rise back to life so that he could be cool or liked or be miraculous, but he did so on purpose. And as he rose, his next reaction was first to tell the disciples the task that they had ahead of them. 
And I hope that you came to this service this morning knowing the task that is ahead of you in light of the resurrection. As the Father sent Jesus, so He is sending us. You see, there's a lot of meaning in the, in the resurrection theologically. Because theologically, the resurrection is God's stamp of approval on Jesus' ministry. It is the confirmation that Jesus is the Son of God. And it's evidence of everything that Jesus claimed. Yes, the resurrection means all of that. But don't overlook Jesus' own words and account of the resurrection once he rises back to life. The first thing he points out is you have a task to fulfill. That's the first thing he told them. And that's the first thing that we need to realize as well. If we were to create a timeline of Jesus' life, I would put it like this. His birth, his life and ministry, his death, his resurrection, and the commissioning of his disciples and his ascension. That's how I would put it. That for me is the major events of Jesus' life and his ministry. And us getting to do what Jesus wants to do is very much a part of that. That's one of the reasons why we should be celebrating this Resurrection Sunday. You see, in terms of this commission, what it also reveals to us that we as followers of Jesus are characterized as being sent. Usually, we as Christians characterize ourselves as being holy, as being different from the world, as being righteous, right? You look at our behavior, it must be different, but I want to say there's something that's more telling than that. Holiness, yes. Behavior, yes. That's all a part of what characterizes us. But just as important is what we are characterized for. You are saved because Jesus wants to send you. And that's why he drew his disciples to himself, because he did exactly the same thing. Being sent out to do the work of Jesus is a part of your and my DNA. There's no way that we can get around it. And what's interesting is after this occasion, after the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, the disciples were no longer called disciples. Look in the book of Acts, you won't see the word disciples describing them. You know what they are described as? Apostles. Do you know what apostles mean? Sent ones. No longer mere followers of Jesus, but they are sent ones. And this is how they consider themselves if you look at the book of Acts. Now, brothers and sisters, Jesus showed up that day behind closed doors. And this is the realization that the disciples came to. We walked with him. We watched him die. We learned from him. He is going now. Now we carry it on. That's the realization they came to. And I trust that that is the realization you and I have today. Imagine these doors were locked. Imagine we were in fear. And imagine today Jesus shows up. What a wonderful experience that will be, don't you think? But that experience wouldn't exist simply so that we could feel good because the moment he leaves the building, we then have the realization, hey, Jesus actually sent us to do something. And that's the realization you and I must have as I think of their realization, we have to ask the question, what does being sent look like? Now, we don't have to go far to answer this, this question because, as I mentioned before, in each of the Gospels, Jesus explains to them that he has commissioned to them. And I think if we evaluate each of these instructions, we will have a good idea of what it means. Matthew says, go and make disciples. Mark says, go and proclaim the Gospel. Luke says, preach repentance and forgiveness and be witnesses. That's what it means to be sent. All of the things that we don't do, that's what it means to be sent. As a disciple, we do understand that this must be what we are supposed to be doing. But I feel what the church has lost sight of is that this is the primary thing that we should be doing. If you were to ask me today, 2,000 years after Jesus came, died, and resurrected, 
and tell these disciples, if you were to ask me today, what is the primary motive or the primary task of the church, simply based on what I see, I would say the church's primary goal today is to gather on a Sunday morning for worship. That's our primary goal. But Jesus didn't die so that we can enjoy ourselves on a Sunday morning. He said, look here. He said, touch here. Now that you know it is me, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. That's what it looks like to be sent. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit and continue to explain what this gospel message looks like in terms of forgiveness of sins and those who would be forgiven. The final person I want to focus on this morning is our favorite one probably in the story, and that's Thomas, Didymus. And Thomas wasn't with the disciples on that day when Jesus first showed up. And when they told him, we have seen the Lord, Thomas had a very different reaction than, than, than we would most, most hope. But one can understand why he would be skeptical, why, why a person would be skeptical. Someone had died, now you're saying they're all alive, and Thomas says, unless I put my finger in his hands, and unless I put my hand in his side, if he says this, I will not believe. Now, those, are, those are strong words. That's a, that's a big claim, that's a big indictment, in fact, of someone who claims to have been a follower of Jesus. I will not believe. But I think, if you think about it, Thomas must have heard about his death and resurrection. And in addition to this, you, you, you know what I have a problem with, with Thomas? It's not that he doesn't believe the Lord, that's a big thing, but he doesn't even believe the other disciples. He doesn't even believe these people that he also has been walking with for three years. His heart is so hardened that he can't even trust the witness account of people who are the closest to him. And that's probably why we today have labeled him doubting Thomas, because of the extent of his unbelief. But I think we will all agree that Thomas should have believed, based on what Jesus said, based on the scriptures, based on what his friends said, he should have believed, but he still didn't. Now, we know that there are some people who are like this. It doesn't matter what you show them, it doesn't matter what you tell them, they simply won't move in terms of the understanding that needs to be applied by faith. Today, people want scientific proof before they believe that he's a God. They want scientific proof before they can believe that miracles actually happen, that water turned to wine, that a storm was called. You put on the Discovery Channel and you, you hear anything about Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible we know. It's about archaeologists and people trying to figure things out. Are these facts scientifically proven? Because if you can prove it, then I will believe it. And that's the same thing that Thomas was saying in this case. But, can I tell you something? I think Thomas in this story is a distraction. Because a lot of the times we focus on Thomas in the story, but don't forget who the main person is, and that's Jesus. Because Jesus, a week later, shows up. Are the doors locked? Yes, okay, here I come. Is Thomas here? Yes, Thomas. Come and put your fingers here. Come and put your hand here. And you know what I think is so interesting of what Jesus is doing? Jesus actually provides Thomas with the thing that he requires in order to believe. Thomas wanted physical proof. Okay, said Jesus, I'm going to give you physical proof. Here it is. Here I am. And Thomas then believes. But I believe the reason Jesus does this is because of the point he illustrates next. He tells Thomas, you have seen me, you have seen me physically. You have this physical evidence and now you believe. Good. It's good that you acknowledge that I am God. Right? But he then goes to say, blessed are those 
who have not seen, yet still believe. I don't think there's a single person in this building here today who has seen the physical Lord Jesus. But I trust and hope that we will believe. Why can you believe? Because enough has been given to us so that we can believe. Like the disciples, we've got the Old Testament scriptures. Better than the disciples, we have their own recorded words. And in addition to that, we have the experience of the Holy Spirit which confirms all of these things. You haven't seen the Lord physically. Perhaps you're not going to get scientific proof. But that's not what is required. What is required is faith. I always ask myself the question, why does God choose to be an invisible God? And the best reason I can come up with that is because He wants faith from you. That's the main thing He wants. The light in Hebrews talks about faith, you know, it says Hebrews 11 verse 1, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But it goes on to say in verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, some of us are reading this resurrection story and we're thinking, hey man, I'm not, I'm not so sure about this thing. I see all of these people believe it, but I, I have just got so much difficulty with it. Can I tell you the thing that is missing in your life? is not information, it's not evidence, but it is faith. Faith enough to believe that you can place your trust in Jesus, that the things that were said about him actually happened, and the things that he promised he can fulfill. That's what that is, and that is what is required. Faith. Jesus, I think, deals kindly with Thomas. I suspect that it won't be our experience as Thomas, as Thomas's experience was. You see, he saw Jesus only once the evidence was given. And I want to say, brothers and sisters, Jesus might not always give us the same kind of evidence that we are looking for. But as one who trusts Jesus, as one who has faith in Jesus, I want to tell you, you can believe in Him. Jesus is real. Jesus is true. And the things that they say happen, I believe it. Because I have experienced this Jesus of whom they are speaking. So here's our conclusion, and I want to end this morning with John's conclusion of this chapter. Listen to what he says. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, believing Jesus, it's not just about knowing something. But the moment you believe in Him and you place your faith and your trust in Him, what results is life in His name. And until you believe in Him, I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, you have not yet experienced life. And you have not yet experienced what it means to have everlasting life. That's what belief is. In Jesus to accomplish. So let's think about those realizations and I'll ask you, have you realized them? Like Mary, have you realized that there's no longer a reason to cry? Where is your faith? Like the disciples, have you realized that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not just a fantastic event, but it means something for you and I? That through his resurrection, we now have the commission to go and do the work that Jesus came to do and left for us to do. And finally, do you have the realization that it is faith that is required to believe in him and that by believing you will have a lost life? Let's pray together. Father, this morning, I pray, help us to realize the things we need to realize. Some of us have become so familiar with the truth, so familiar with your word, so familiar with what it says, 
that we haven't yet realized what is required of us in light of your word. Won't you help us to make that connection this morning? Won't you connect the truth with what we need to realize, understand, and be fully aware of? I pray in this, in this place, Lord, bless us with an understanding of your truth. Bless us so that we are challenged to live in light of that truth and realize everything we need to realize. Lord, we want to say this morning, there is no longer a need to cry for you have risen. We believe in you, we love you, and we invite you to move us, to, to lead us on a life of realization of this wonderful Savior. We pray this in your name. Amen.